please be very welcome to the third panel of the second day of the Electoral Integrity Project uh, annual workshop or conference. Um, from my side, it's always a pleasure to, to attend and to be part of this great project. And I think that the presentations that we've had so far yesterday and today prove uh, these points. Uh, and I'm sure you also share this uh, with me. So today we, are, we have um, a few of very interesting uh, topics and, and presentations and papers in, in, in the cases that I've read them. Um, and so we're about to start. The topic of this panel is electoral backsliding, country and regional case studies. I'll be the chair. My name is Carla. I'm from Portugal, uh, University of Coimbra, but I'm actually based in, in Lisbon. And we have here as a discussant, Meret Berg Sieberg from Aros University. I'm sure I misspelled the name, so sorry. I'll try my best. Uh, and we had uh, five papers in the panel, but we happen to have just four presentations today. So the first one uh, is not present here, so we'll go straight to the second one. Um, <clears throat> so the, the second paper, um, and which I'll be, uh, for which I'll be a discussant as well, so I know what I'm talking about. So it's, it's called the Inter-American Democrat, the Democratic Charter and the Electoral Integrity Conditions in Latin America, Too Little, Too Late. I think the title is already very promising. <clears throat> so I'll give the floor, the floor without further delays. We have here the co-authors. So Jose Ignacio Hernandez from Harvard University and Andres Bello from Castilla-La Mancha University. So... Uh, we'll assign, uh, as agreed, 10 to 12 minutes for each presentation, so I'll have the tough task of controlling the time. So, Jose Ignacio and Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be here um, commenting on this ongoing research that has to do with the effectiveness of the Inter-American Democratic Charter in Latin America from the particular perspective of the electoral integrity conditions. So again, uh, it's, it's quite a pleasure. So I'm going to share with you a short presentation. Um, okay, I hope that now you can see the presentation which uh, summarize um, the preliminary conclusions that uh, are in the draft paper that I already share uh, with you. And, uh, and indeed the title uh, is an advance of the conclusions of my research. The uh, Inter-American Democratic Charter has been applied only in few cases and regrettably too late and this is why I am also want to uh, share with you some proposals that uh, I am working uh, about how to improve the Inter-American uh, Democratic Charter. But let's start uh, with uh, the long and winding road that is not only a great song by the Beatles, but a description of how the uh, democratic clauses emerge in the Inter-American law. Uh, the basic instrument of the Inter-American law, which are the American Declaration and the Organization of American State Charter, are based on the non-intervention principle. And one of the main manifestations of the non-intervention principle is the so-called Estrada Doctrine. Uh, it's a basically a Mexican doctrine, according to which the democratic origin of government cannot be challenged uh, in international relations, basically because uh, the democratic order and broadly speaking, the political order is a domestic affair not covered by international law. This is why until 1991, the real impact or influence of the inter-American law over the democratic system in the region was uh, very weak because as I explained, the main approach was based on the non-intervention principle and the protection of the sovereignty of the government to decide about uh, the political system. Uh, as a result of different causes, uh, mainly the wave of democratization in the region, in 1991, 
the General Assembly of the Organization of American State approve uh, the first uh, democratic clause that allows the General Assembly to overview democratic backslides in the region. Then in, in 1992, the Organization of American State Charter was modified in the so-called Washington Protocol in order to uh, vest it in the General Assembly the authority to suspend countries which democratic order has been diminished. Finally, in 2001, during the Summit of the Americas, the Quebec Declaration was approved in order to adopt the Inter-American Democratic Charter. There is a discussion here about the nature of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. This is not a treaty, this is not a convention. The Inter-American Democratic Charter was approved by the General Assembly of the Organization of American State. And this is why even today in the member state of the Organization of American State, there is a contested position between the value of the charter. For some contra, uh, countries, sorry, this is nothing more than a political commitment. For other countries, it is a legal and binding resolution. And in my opinion, of course, this is a legal and binding resolution. Uh, so the Inter-American Democratic Charter established a very broad, and I will add, complex uh, procedure in order to implement the democratic clause. And the two trigger events that can allow uh, the implementation of the democratic charter are the unconstitutional interruption of the democratic order and the unconstitutional alteration of the constitutional regime. And here start the problems because there is no a unified definition about those trigger events. And since 2001, 20 years ago when the charter was approved, the Organization of American State has tried to precise those two trigger events, but as I explained you, the contested position in the region regarding the non-intervention principle and the legal nature of the chart, uh, there has been not able to advance in a precise uh, uh, definition of those events that definitely are uh, concepts that are interpreted uh, under a political, uh, lens. So who can uh, claim at the first instance that there has been an, an unconstitutional interruption or an unconstitutional alteration of the democratic order, the affected state, the secretary of the organization, and any member state? If any of those subjects consider that there has been any of those two triggers events, it can request a meeting of the permanent council that can initiate diplomatic efforts to try to solve the crisis. And eventually it can request a meeting consultation of the foreign affairs ministries in order to promote a peaceful and diplomatic solution. If despite the effort, uh, the political crisis continue, then the General Assembly uh, has the power to uh, adopt new diplomatic uh, initiative. And only if those diplomatic initiatives fails, then the General Assembly with the vote of the two thirds of the parties can adopt as a um, collective sanction, the suspension of the member state. As you can see, this is a very complex procedure and the trigger events, uh, even though there is no specific definition, but just when you read that, you have an image of some very serious political catastrophe. Uh, and indeed the experience in the implementation of the, not only the democratic clause of the Inter-American Democratic Charter, but also the democratic clauses in the um, 1991 resolution and the Organization of American States Charter demonstrate that uh, the implementation of these inter-American mechanism of protections are extremely, uh, extremely are relative and extremely exceptional. Uh, this doesn't mean, of course, that the, that the Inter-American law does not cover uh, electoral integrity conditions. Quite the contrary, uh, sorry for this, according to the declaration and Article 20 of the declaration and Article 23 of the American Convention, there are several electoral integrity conditions that were summarized in Article 3 of the Inter-American uh, Democratic Charter periodic free and fair elections based on the secret balloting and universal suffrage as an expression of the sovereignty of the people. We can uh, 
conclude that those are the core electoral conditions in the Inter-American law. And also the Inter-American law has a very special instrument, which are the electoral observation missions as part of the organization initiative for electoral cooperation and observation. Therefore, the main question is at what extent electoral malpractices that violate those electoral integrity conditions can be framed within the charter. And precisely to answer this question, I analyze all the cases in which the democratic clauses in the inter-American law has been applied. Uh, and I will share with you the main conclusions. Uh, but before that, just to a brief commentary about uh, an attempt of the current secretary Almagro to change the Estrada doctrine in which I have been called the Almagro doctrine. And according with this position of the secretary Almagro, electoral malpractices can be considered a violation of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And the case, and the case that promoted this um, proposal of a new interpretation was the Venezuelan democratic collapse. However, and regrettably, um, this is nothing more than a proposal because there is no a consensus within the member state of the Organization of American States to expand the Inter-American Democratic Charter to electoral malpractices that can lead to a severe democratic backslide. So uh, these are the main conclusions of my analysis of all the cases in which the democratic clauses has been applied uh, in the Inter-American uh, law. Uh, the first conclusion is that the most popular democratic clause is the Inter-American Democratic Charter. 86% of all the cases since 1991 in which the democratic clauses has been applied uh, are related with the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Then we have the resolution 1080 of 1991, and finally the Organization of American State. Then I classify all the cases in which those democratic clauses have been applied into three groups. The first group are cases that uh, uh, try to protect the stability of the presidency. Uh, for instance, uh, due to severe political unrest or problems with the, with the legislative. The second groups um, are cases based on abusive decisions adopted by the executive. For instance, decision of the executive that uh, violate the autonomy of the legislative power. And finally, which is the topic of, uh, the main topic of interest, the group number three, electoral malpractice. So this is, uh, this is uh, the experience, this is the main conclusion. 62% of the cases has been related with the stability of the presidency. This means basically, that the electoral uh, clauses in the inter-American law has been applied mostly to protect the president, but not to protect democracy from uh, presidents or from uh, presidential abuses, uh, even regarding electoral conditions. Those are the states in which um, the democratic clauses have been applied. There are three countries in which the democratic clauses have been applied three times, Bolivia, uh, sorry, four countries, Bolivia, Peru, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. However, uh, Nicaragua and Venezuela have been uh, countries mostly affected by the Inter-American Democratic Charter since 2016 and 2021. Therefore, all the cases regarding Nicaragua and Venezuela demonstrate the democratic backslide in these two countries. Uh, more specifically, I previously was explaining about the experience with all the democratic clauses uh, in the Inter-American law. Again, there are the 1991 resolution, the Organization of American States Charter, and finally the Inter-American Inter Democratic Charter, sorry. And here I analyze only the cases in which the Inter-American Democratic Charter has applied since 2001. And again, the conclusion is that in 72% in of the cases, the charter has been applied to protect the president. And in 17% of the cases has been applied to electoral malpractice. This is why in my opinion, in practice, 
the Inter-American Democratic Charter has been more an instrument to protect the stability of the presidency than an instrument to protect electoral integrity condition. But what happened in the few cases in which the charter was applied uh, regarding electoral uh, malpractices? Uh, there are three cases, Venezuela in 2018, Bolivia 2019, and Nicaragua in 2021. And uh, in the cases of Venezuela and Nicaragua, regrettably, the implementation of the charter was not able to prevent the deterioration of the democracy. However, uh, a successful case or relatively successful case is Bolivia because the implementation of the charter was uh, uh, facilitated um, and the solution of the political crisis that emerged after the um, fraudulent election of President Evo Morales. But however, and I am going to uh, finalize my presentation here, if we consider the Venezuela and Nicaragua experience, there are some conclusions. Uh, the electoral malpractices have not been able uh, to prevent, as I explained, democratic backslide in the case of Venezuela and Nicaragua. Uh, the implementation of the democratic charter has not been related with electoral observation mission, but uh, with a general assessment of the deterioration of the democratic order in Venezuela and Nicaragua, and therefore the repudiation of the um, electoral integrity condition, and therefore the presidential elections conducted in Venezuela and Nicaragua. However, and this could be at some point good news, even though electoral observation mission has not been related to cases in which the Inter-American Democratic Charter has been applied, uh, however, the electoral observation mission has been a useful tool to promote the restoration of the constitutional order in cases in which the OAS has concluded that at some extent the democratic order was uh, in peril. Those are the cases among other of Ecuador 2005, Bolivia, uh, sorry for this mistake, 2008, and Paraguay 2013, in which a free and fair elections with the support of electoral integrity missions uh, collaborated in the uh, solution of political crisis. Uh, final, con final proposal, what to do then? Uh, the main con it really has to be final, very, very yeah, short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that, I have been talking too much. Uh, uh, my main recommendation here is that we need to implement a follow-up mechanism to promote a more interactive a relation between the Inter-American Democratic Charter and the electoral observation missions in order to favor the uh, implementation of the charter to nurture uh, electoral democratic, electoral integrity conditions. Thank you so much and sorry for the violation of the time constraint. Okay, thank you so much. It was a very interesting presentation. I'm sure we can talk more about this in the Q&A. Um, so we move forward to the second presentation of this panel today. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, we skipped the first one. So uh, we presented the second one on the program, now the third one. Um, so the, this presentation is called Zimbabwe ahead of the 2023 harmonized elections. Uh, and it will be done by Rekai Ruzinga from uh, the Zimbabwe Election Support Network. So I don't know if Rekai is here in the room. Madison, maybe you know something. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, you have the floor yeah. now. Thank you so much. So uh, it would be 10 to 12 minutes, okay? Thank you very much. It's okay, I will be done. Okay, thank you. So my presentation is, is already been stated, focuses on Zimbabwe. The title is Zimbabwe ahead of the 2023 harmonized elections and apologies to everyone for sharing my uh, draft late. Um, so to start with, I think I should note uh, that Zimbabwe is certainly not a democracy and uh, at no point in time did Zimbabwe attain um, the status of a democracy. So I'm supposed to talk about democratic backsliding in a context that has never been democratic to start with. So what do I do? 
uh, to be able to talk about democratic backsliding in the context of Zimbabwe, I rely on a definition, uh, the definition of uh, Wildner in last 2018 would define um, democratic, democratic backsliding, perhaps a, a bit more loosely, is uh, the deterioration of qualities associated with democratic governance within any regime. So I'm not uh, confining it to democratic, democratic regimes. So when you look at Zimbabwe, it is in nominal terms, the qualities associated with democratic, democratic governance. And um, these include uh, the multi-party elections that are held in Zimbabwe. Uh, and uh, with the multi-party elections, there is universal uh, franchise. Zimbabwe is in courts in, 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 in it is independent institutions supporting democracy and independent media and independent in courts against judiciary separation of powers. It is a constitution and at least in name it is a constitutional democracy as well as a representative democracy in which elections are conducted which should enable the people to choose their leaders or their representatives. It is in a respect of this that I then uh, observe uh, or make the case for democratic backsliding in Zimbabwe. Uh, for instance, though the country has had many elections uh, since the attainment of uh, independence in 1980, you would find that even a case or review of those uh, um, elections in terms of uh, the assessment of the integrity, you would find that uh, the evidence would point to a case of uh, democratic backsliding. Uh, because whereas the country has constitutionalized, ritualized elections, um, their quality, I think, is, uh, is so poor that it doesn't, um, it, it, it doesn't qualify Zimbabwe to be a, a, a democracy. So I start with voter registration, the voter registration process. Unfortunately, I'm using my phone to make the presentation because my laptop uh, just had uh, a problem with the speakers. I don't know what's happening, but I'm using my phone to make the presentation. So looking at uh, voter registration in Zimbabwe, and maybe before I get into that, I should emphasize that the challenges that Zimbabwe has had in terms of electoral politics, they are more or less the same, or they've remained the same over the years. So voter registration is one key area where we cannot pick sliding uh, in Zimbabwe's case, particularly uh, because Zimbabwe adopted the biometric voter registration in 2017, moving away from the manual voter registration process. With the manual voter registration process, there are quite a number of challenges, including the presence on uh, the voters row of uh, uh, ghost voters, the names of uh, deceased voters, etc, etc. And uh, when the BVR was adopted in 2017, I think uh, about 5 million people had been registered by the end of that process. And uh, it was a good thing in the sense that the number of people, the percentage of the number of people that had been registered, if you are looking at it relative to the targeted uh, voter population or the eligible voting population, I think it exceeded, it surpassed the target that had been set by the elections managing, man management body, which was at 70%. So, that was uh, something that was progressive. However, if you look at what is happening uh, today with uh, voter registration, we recently had in Zimbabwe a voter registration please in the month of February this year, and then in April this year again. This bliss to start with was postponed last year because it was scheduled to start on the 6th of December and end this year in February, but it was uh, postponed. And the reason that was given by the EMB was that they wanted to enable the civil registry to issue uh, ID documents that are required for people to register to vote to as many people as possible before the election management body could then roll out the BVR blitz. And with the BVR blitz, they are moving closer to the people. It's not like uh, the centralized voter registration that they will be doing throughout the electoral cycle where people have to visit provincial and district registration centers to start. With the BVR bliss, they will be moving closer to the people to register them in their uh, respective wards. But then what uh, happened is uh, uh, that, number one, the bliss 
to issue out the IDs that are a prerequisite for one to register uh, did not take place until uh, on the eve of the second blitz, the second and last blitz of the voter registration exercise in April. So uh, there are some people who were not able to get IDs to be able to register. Number two, what, what has also happened is in rural areas, it has been easier for people to get IDs with the assistance of traditional leaders and then be able to register to vote compared to the situation in urban areas where uh, it's uh, really difficult for one to get a, an ID. And historically in Zimbabwe, rural areas are the stronghold of uh, the ruling party, whereas your urban areas are the stronghold of the opposition. So this is it with uh, the voter registration. In the paper, I also include some statistics um, because there are two organizations Two watchdog election watchdog organizations, civil state organizations, the election resource center and the Zimbabwe election support network that have done a great job in terms of uh, monitoring the process and also doing uh, some analysis. So let me move on to the voters' row. With the voters' row, the the election management board recently uh, uh, came under uh, criticism, intense criticism from stakeholders. Uh, because of the manner in which it was administering the voter registration process, in particular also issues relating to the voters' role. So there is a, a pressure group that is called Team Pachedu. They exposed quite a number of issues that they said were problematic with the voters' role. And then the commission uh, defended itself and said the voters' role that had been analyzed by this uh, pressure group had not been officially issued to the stakeholder who got or obtained the voters' role from the EMB. So that was the, the explanation. And so they disowned it. And they also said it had been deliberately tempered with so that it would suit the narrative of the stakeholder who had obtained the voters' role from uh, the commission. And as a result, there were some uh, EMB staff members who were sacked or they were suspended rather uh, because of that. But then the a problematic issue is that when CSOs formally requested following due process for a copy of uh, an up-to-date copy of the voters so that they could uh, independently analyze it, the ZEC or the election management body could not provide or have available any. So one civil society organization, as you would find in that paper, went ahead and analyzed the voters so that was in the public domain. And they also picked quite a number of issues, including a polling sessions that had been removed uh, when they uh, compared the 2018 voters' role. Uh, we last had elections in Zimbabwe, elections in 2018, and then the 2022 voters' role. That was going to be used for by-elections that were held in March this year. So some moved, and uh, in addition to that, there were some other polling sessions that had been added uh, to that uh, voters' role. There were some people who had been moved from, from constituencies where they were registered to vote in 2018 to different constituencies in 2022. And these people had not been informed of these changes when they were affected. So the, the, the exact statistics you would find in, um, in the paper. And let me move on to delimitation, demarcation of electoral boundaries for purposes of uh, electing uh, representatives. This is a process that was last conducted in Zimbabwe in 2008. And uh, according to the constitution that was adopted in 2013, the delimitation process should follow a population census. So the last census was in 2012, and uh, then we recently had another census in 2022. But there was a debate where uh, the EMB and some other stakeholders were arguing that uh, there was need to delink the two processes the delimitation in the population census. And the argument um, was premised on the fact that the delimitation exercise is based on the number of registered voters rather than the census. It doesn't rely on the census. But the counter argument was that this uh, census would provide a data set that could be used uh, to just ensure that we can check uh, the credibility of uh, the outcome of uh, the delimitation process in terms of the number of people we expect to find in any locality, be it a province, a ward, or a constituency, that it would provide a guide 
uh, in some sense. And you would find that because we last had delimitation in 2008, there is need to now rationalize the constituencies as we go towards the 2023 harmonized elections. We have words, uh, the word, this is um, a, 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 the local authority, what that I'm talking about. We have words that are a big in terms of their size, the number of registered voters you find in those words is big as uh, some constituencies in the country, just to put what I'm saying into perspective. So there is need to rationalize those constituencies. And uh, the, ultimately what then happened is the census was then moved forwards from 2022, uh, whichever month it was supposed to take place, so that it could be conducted earlier to allow ample time for the delimitation exercise to be conducted. So that was progressive. But then civil state organizations have not been allowed uh, as of now to uh, observe the delimitation process, just subject it to um, observation so that there could be transparency and they can satisfy stakeholders that everything is going on well. Because uh, in the constitution, they don't have a mandate to start organizations to do so. But this is something that we are hoping that the EMB will agree to just in the interest of promoting transparency. And in terms of voter education, we have really had some progressive amendments here in Zimbabwe in the sense that the restrictions that used to obtain uh, with regards to voter registration have been relaxed over the years, including uh, amending the law that uh, did or governed the provision of uh, voter education, which um, I think had uh, a number of uh, restrictions, including the banning uh, of foreign funding and things like that, and also restricting uh, or, or rather uh, prohibiting the participation of civil society organizations in civic and voter education provision. But what is happening at the moment is that there are still in practice a, a restriction on the part of civil society organizations to take part in civic and voter education provision. For instance, in February, there were some voter educators who were stopped from providing civic and voter education by activists belonging to the ruling party in a certain constituency. And they were thereafter handed over to the police but then they were released later after uh, the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights intervened, which is an association uh, of uh, lawyers, non-government organization who uh, work uh, to support human rights in Zimbabwe. Not only that, there is also another organization that had its voter educators stop from providing voter education after um, the, ele the elections management body had received an instruction from the president's office that the materials that were being used by this organization were not uh, still this interference in terms of uh, a civil society organization providing civil and education. And we have also had uh, a situation in Zimbabwe. I, I'm sorry, Reke, we have to, you have to start concluding, okay? Okay, let me, let me just, just say the last thing, then I, I conclude. So I wanted to say, we have also had a situation whereby the opposition in Zimbabwe has suffered a number of uh, restrictions. So uh, recently, the leader of uh, the opposition has tried to make inroads in uh, constituencies that used to be uh, strongholds of other. And uh, when we consider the fact that in 2018, the last harmonized elections that we had, the, the opposition had space to campaign in those previous no-go areas. Uh, now we look at the, a situation where we have uh, the opposition being restricted, the rallies being stopped, the opposition leader being um, attacked in meet the people tours. You find that there is evidence of uh, backsliding in that. And the last thing is the suspension of by-elections. Uh, in 2020, March 2020, we only had them two years later. Yet other sectors of the economy had opened up and we had uh, church gatherings that we attended by thousands, uh, tens of thousands. Uh, and uh, the last thing maybe is the by-elections that were held in, on 26 March, they were replete with uh, a, a electoral irregularities, both pre-election and during the election. Let me end there in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very lively presentation. I'm sure you can go back to that in the, in the Q&A. Thank you very much. So now in the program, we have policing fraud in France, or moving continents, policing fraud in France, balancing political realities while monitoring malfeasance. 
So this presentation will be made by Joseph, Joseph Claver from the University of Michigan, Walter Meban, junior, uh, junior University of Michigan. So you have the floor now. Thank you. Great. Um, can people see the uh, screen? Great. Um, so this, um, this is work, it's joint work that I've been um, working with Walter Mebbin for, um, it's related to um, his longstanding work related to like um, fraud detection and um, like statistics related to this and my own work related to the institutions that resolve uh, disputed elections. Okay, um, actually, wait, I'm sorry. Um, the, I can't see my screen now. Wait, um, are we still on the, the first page of the? Yes, you, yeah. we can see it very well. Okay. We're seeing um, a PDF probably. Yeah, uh -huh. so, um, did the page just switch? Uh, not yet. Try the second one. You're on for I'm page sorry. One. Let me um, let me. No, it's one? fine. Just go okay. to page two if you want to switch it. Great. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I don't know exactly what's going on, but regardless. Um. So, yeah. So, to motivate the issue, I mean, in what potentially shouldn't be. Um. I mean, I know this isn't exactly a tough crowd for this, but so why um why is it important to, uh, to potentially like develop way uh, you know ways other than um, electoral, like uh, more traditional forms of election monitoring to detect fraud and resolve election disputes. First of all, you know, um, elections are, you know, determining the democratic intent of the population is um, in order to, you know, select the person being elected is essentially um, the uh, point of an election. And so it's a, an incredibly crucial element of democracy. Um, these techniques can meaningfully complement other monitoring strategies, um, like in, in the sense that uh, while they're, you know, they're important, it's important to consider these within the broader context of sort of what other monitoring efforts are saying. Um, there are certain advantages in the sense that these, um, when they, uh, using election results as inputs, instead of um, they have the advantage that of um, one disadvantage of traditional monitoring is that it sort of only can see what's happening where monitors are present. This is sort of like a well-known um, just uh, factor. And so this can uh, complement this because it sort of allows for um, a sort of broader um, scope of monitoring. Good. Um, and uh, as we've seen uh, um, recently, there's been a rise in sort of disputed electoral outcomes sort of throughout the world. Um, and that so um, we've also seen the sort of different ways that these disputes are resolved um, in uh, in different countries. Good. So, um, and then so the what this paper does then is it sort of it's ultimately going to compare sort of um, uh, dispute cases to some of these uh, statistical um, fraud detection techniques. So we'll turn first to uh, the dispute resolution, uh, the dispute um, resolution system in France. So in France, the Constitutional Council is in charge of resolving uh, disputes related to French um, national ele elections. So elections to the National Assembly, um, the presidency, as well as the Senate election process. Um, the process is very um, accessible to citizens as well as candidates. Um, a, um, all you have to do is, is um, submit essentially a letter through the mail. There's no sort of fee associated with, um, with uh, filing a dispute. So disputes are frequent and um, uh, as are uh, cancellations. Um, generally after each French election, there will be on the order of hundreds of disputes filed with the Constitutional Council. Um, and then about six to eight um, district level elections will then be canceled and have to be filled by a um, by-election. Um, so, uh, 
in crucial sort of uh, to this is the um, the role of the the margin of victory because the sort of the burden uh, the burden of proof for sort of getting a dispute to be upheld and the uh, contest overturned is that the ultimately the number of you know potentially affected votes has to um, by uh, the whatever improprieties are alleged has to exceed the margin of victory. And so, and um, this can be by improprieties, this can be essentially anything, right? Um, in France, it's often um, issues with the electoral rolls systems of, of like the various like signatures people used to sign in, things related to this or problems with proxies, uh, proxy voting. Um, let's see. So um, I'll turn now to talk a bit just very briefly about the um, statistical package. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna be extremely brief here. I can talk more about sort of the nuts and bolts in the Q&A um, as well as there's much more discussion in the paper. But so it builds on sort of past efforts um, to uh, um, sort of uh, detect um, electoral fraud or like anomalies using um, statistical techniques. This particular um, package builds on a paper by um, Peter Klemek and others from 2012 that essentially the sort of the, again, this is like very broad strokes, but the essential um, sort of um, intuition there is that clean elections, and this varies a bit uh, depending on electoral system, uh, are essentially unimodal across several different um, election statistics, crucially turnout and winners vote share. Um, and then yes, so uh, essentially we, um, the package then sort of differentiates between in, in the way that it, you know, um, like uh, draws and um, makes these, um, uh, like use these techniques, it essentially um, use it, you end up with um, manufactured votes, which is the uh, type that you would, traditionally think of as being through um, ballot box stuffing or just um, essentially being stolen from non-voters and then um, stolen votes, which are just like votes either just, um, you know, throwing out other ones or, um, yeah, similar. And again, if you have more questions about the nuts and bolts of this, I can talk about that in the Q&A. But this also, this allows us to estimate the magnitude of fraud in a district, which is important because again, we're ultimately interested in um, comparing it to the margins of victory. So, and again, as I said before, that, um, there's a, um, um, there's a crucial issue that has been um, present with these types of techniques is that while it is true that generally <clears throat> fraudulent elections can be detected, like they sort of, there is a trace statistically from fraudulent activities, it's also true that other non-fraudulent activities um, can lead to similar things. So it's important to consider these estimates in sort of a broader context. And that's why I've also talked about it sort of as a complement to existing, um, uh, to existing um, strategies. So turning, here is some um, descriptive uh, statistics. So these are the, um, are, uh, this is just a table of from the 2012 National Assembly in France, um, electoral districts where um, the model estimated um, more than 100 and I'll call them fraudulent votes because again, the um, crucially, as I mentioned about why um, like other things that can trigger this, that another thing that can um, potentially look similar to fraud in the way surely that it presents itself in the um, election results is um, things like um, strategic voting because of the way that it introduces similar dependencies in um, voter behavior. But so here we can see um, notably the, um, the yellow highlighted box just highlights that in um, one of the districts where actually the um, number of the estimated fraudulent votes is actually very comparable to the um, margin was in fact canceled. Um, but that you can also see that disputes are um, not are, uh, quite common. Um, you know, continue going quickly here. This is a similar um, plot for 27, uh, table for 2017, although we can see that it estimates generally that um, there was a, a higher number of either um, electoral issues or potentially more um, strategic voting in France. So I've highlighted again, cases where the, um, oh, I'm sorry, this uh, table is messed up. The, um, the third column here should be the uh, margin of victory and dispute status is uh, the last column. 
But so we can see once again, there are a couple of cases where actually the um, number of estimated uh, e-forensics fraudulent votes exceeds the margin of victory. And in one case, um, it was in fact canceled. That was in the uh, second district in Guyana. But in Dubes, the, uh, the third district, it wasn't even uh, disputed. And um, what's interesting is that this it would be a case where I would, I would say that it uh, was like triggering the uh, algorithm, the um, like e-forensics package by uh, a strategic voting, because this was a case where there was considerable um, convergence on the second round on the um, sort of the uh, moderate uh, right candidate, because there was a strong uh, National Front candidate in the uh, first round that then subsequently didn't make it to the runoff, and so there was a lot of um, uh, strategic voting happening in uh, the, the uh, second round, likely. So um, the final analysis that I'll, that I'll go through very quickly here, because I know that I'm, um, we're uh, pressed for time, is we um, just run a, a straightforward regression of the estimates of these fraudulent votes, um, both manufactured and stolen, as a function of the margin of victory. So that is the number of manufactured over the margin of victory in that particular district. Um, and the um, similar with the stolen votes on both the number of election disputes filed in that district in 2012 and 2017 um, using uh, uh, Poisson regressions and also on whether or not um, uh, the uh, a, um, given a dispute, there was a, uh, it was in fact canceled. So, um, because of the censoring introduced by the fact that um, the only cases where there could be a potential annulment were cases where it was a dispute, we also we adjust for this. Um, we see here that for um, 2012, uh, a positive, um, uniformly uh, positive relationship between both measures of the um, uh, fraudulent or, you know, um, depending uh, on the case, potentially strategic, um, are both positively related with cases as well as annulments. And we see a similar pattern for um, 2017 as well, where the, uh, the um, these fraud measures are positively correlated with both sort of the, um, the cases filed in a district, so behavior on the part of citizens and candidates, as well as um, annulments, which is a behavior on the part of the uh, judges of the constitutional court. Um, and I believe that um, I'm just about out of time. So, um, but yeah, uh, so I'll say, um, very briefly, but um, uh, we have, um, in addition to the next step uh, described there, some, I'm currently uh, going back to the dispute documents to um, uh, code whether each dispute in question was follow, uh, filed by a party or candidate or a citizen to see whether there's, well, um, to get, see whether the relationship is strengthened when we look only at cases where you know, parties and candidates sort of thought it was worthwhile versus the potential uh, cheap talk of a disaffected um, you know, citizen who's uh, you know, had a, a bad experience at a polling place, but uh, you know, the contest is otherwise fine. Great, and that's it. I don't wanna take up any more time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting, very interesting presentation. I think we have very diverse uh, presentations here in this in this panel. So we'll move to the next one, to the to the last one. So which is called diversity or distraction: How sham parties influence the electoral process in Hungary. And we have with us here today Reka Varnagi from the Corvinus University of Budapest and Anna Novak from the Corvinus University of Budapest. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you and welcome everybody. We are really happy to be here. I'm just wondering that this way I can see you, so I won't turn on the usual uh, slide paying option, but uh, I will uh, show my slides like this. So, uh, yes, I'm Rika Varnais from the Corvinus University of Budapest, and Anna, uh, who is the, uh, my PhD student, is here with us as well. And we are going to present you an ongoing research 
about Hungary and Hungarian elections and Hungarian parties running at elections. Why is it important? I don't know how aware or how uh, well do you know the Hungarian case, but uh, uh, we have a pretty contested democratic, uh, uh, democratic or not democratic regime right now in Hungary, who changed very much the uh, context of uh, uh, party dynamics and also the electoral process in the, in the last decade. Uh, and we are uh, trying to look into the consequences of those changes uh, in the framework of this research. So, um, if you look at Hungary, you are going to see a rather uh, severe case of depolarization going on. So, from already from the 2000s, from the beginning of 2000s, you could see a two-block two block politics arising in Hungary, with one party ruling the right wing of the political spectrum, which is Fidesz, and another party ruling the left uh, uh, wing of the political uh, spectrum, which is the Socialist Party. And uh, with this growing polarization, and I don't know uh, if the noise really bothers you, please, I will try to move around, but hopefully not. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, uh, the, the strong depolarization trend was broken when in, uh, 2006, we had a speech by the socialist prime minister that caused a lot of uh, fear and protest in Hungary. And as a result, in 2010, uh, Fidesz won the election by a landslide victory. And in 2010, we call it uh, a critical election because uh, the Fidesz became the governing party and has been the governing party ever since. So for the last 12 years, and has won the last uh, three elections in Hungary. And uh, all three elections, it has won by the two thirds, so qualified majority, which actually opens the opportunity for them to change any and every kind of political structure in Hungary uh, from the constitution to the, to the latest and uh, smallest political regulation. So we, uh, literature usually states that Fidesz became a dominant party, not only because it has a qualified majority, but uh, also because of the repeated wins, and also because of the changes it generates in the political structure of Hungary. Uh, well, all those changes, for example, the uh, uh, taking over the media landscape and uh, 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 introducing new rulings to courts that question the independence of the courts, and also uh, privatization of the uh, educational sector, especially the university se sector, question uh, the quality of democracy in Hungary. So um, in the literature, there have been talks going on about stimulated democracy on, or Hungary being a hybrid regime or competitive authoritarian regime. So depending on the perspective or what part of the debate um, these writers uh, emphasize, uh, 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 they uh, um, they try to show different parts of the characteristics of the system. But this dominant position of Fidesz is not only explained by the changes it introduced to the political structure, but also by the state of the opposition. With the downfall of the Socialist Party, the left wing of the political spectrum became very, very fragmented, and the opposition opposition became divided. Uh, partly is that there was a far right uh, party that emerged that went even uh, more to the right than Fidesz, and the rest of the opposition parties remained on the left political spectrum. So already Fidesz had two challengers, and then it changed the political system to a more majoritarian system. So it shifted, for example, the electoral process towards the more majoritarian one. Uh, it was ensured that uh, the undivided opposition was not in the position of challenging uh, the Fidesz government and the dominant position of Fidesz. So actually, the opposition was under the, and is under a very clear pressure, institutional pressure, to overcome uh, that division, which resulted in a very highly closed political system. So on the one hand, you have a dominant party, a rising party Fidesz, who is controlling the government position and introduces systemic changes to the political context to ensure that it, um, that it remains the dominant party. And on the other hand, uh, you have the opposition who are, while contesting each other for the dominant position within the opposition, sphere, are under a very huge, huge uh, uh, pressure uh, to become 
uh, united and to stand up uh, to the governing party together. And within this context, uh, uh, Fidesz uh, introduced some changes to the electoral system. Uh, it, uh, we have underlined or we have explained these changes um, more or less in our paper, but in this presentation, we are going to focus uh, on the question that we are dealing with here uh, in, this, uh, in this research, which is the occurrence of sham, sham parties that is explained by the change of cam campaign financing rules. So uh, after the victory uh, of Fidesz, uh, it, as I said, introduced a new regulatory framework for, for elections and campaign financing was part of that new regulatory framework. And there have been very many problems with campaign financing before, as I'm sure there is in every country of the world. It is one of the spheres of uh, the electoral process which is highly corrupted, or uh, usually, uh, especially in, in um, uh, non-working uh, uh, democracies. Well, Fidesz uh, uh, introduced a new system uh, where uh, they offered the uh, state uh, funds uh, to both candidates and parties. So if you look at the system described on my slide, you can see that uh, there was a substantial amount of money provided for each and every candidate running at the election, uh, which the candidate re re received on a so-called treasury card, and uh, uh, they could spend that money on different campaign expenditures. And after the, the election, if they do, did not receive two, uh, percent of the vote, they have to reimburse that amount received. The whole process was overviewed by the state audit office, and there was quite a strict uh, uh, payment or sanction there if uh, if uh, 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 the candidate uh, could not show, uh, did not uh, reach the, uh, uh, the required minimum vote, and could not prove how it spent the money, that they then they had to pay back a double amount of money. So while the candidate financing system could be, of course, strict and was strict some time, uh, it was, it was uh, rather strict even in international standards. On the other hand, uh, funds directly to parties uh, uh, regu were regulated in a much more lax matter. So uh, parties uh, also received uh, state funds. It's a bit complicated how the amount of money that can be spent on campaigning, uh, on campaigning was uh, calculated. But uh, uh, the real important uh, uh, part of the process is that uh, the available state funds for parties depended on the number of candidates they could nominate. So depending on how many uh, candidates were nominated, uh, parties received more or less money. They received that money in cash transfer, so not in a, a treasury card, but it was uh, uh, transferred to them or to a bank account. And in the beginning, there were no required minimum votes a party had to gain in order to uh, not to fund, refund uh, those payments. So no matter how the party performed, they could keep uh, the campaign fund. There was an overview process that was also managed by the state audit office, but actually it was a very weak process. So it was uh, just a, a formal uh, examination of uh, the uh, of the fact that the party is presented. For example, in 2014, there was one party who just presented one single bill to the state of the office or one single receipt and uh, that stated that they spent all of the state uh, funds on uh, campaign financing and it was accepted by the state of this office. Um, in writing, there was a sanction that they have to pay back received funds in case there were some anomalies found, but there were never any anomalies found or problems found by the state audit office. So it was not, uh, practically it was never applied. Uh, you might have the hunch already that this new regulatory system offered a huge motivation for sham parties or fake parties or bogus parties to run at the election. And actually it happened. So in 2014, we had 18 parties running at the election. Only four of them entered the parliament. And out of the 14 who did not enter the parliament, only two of them reached 1% of the vote. And uh, the rest is simply disappeared after election. So out of the 12 remaining parties, none of the parties run again at any other election uh, since then. So 
we had 12 parties running running for election, uh, grabbing quite an amount of money. It almost amounted to 5 billion uh, forints, and they never reappeared. So they disappeared uh, from the scene. From the scene. Uh, sorry, there we go. Of course, the, the public uh, paid attention and experts paid attention. So there was quite an uproar uh, of why the state spent so many funds on, on these fake or bogus parties. So there were some modifications made in the upcoming years. I'm not going to look into those modifications, but practically until 2020, no real strict modification was made. The campaign financing system was not really uh, reinforced, neither in terms of sanctions nor in terms of uh, uh, oversight. While parties, uh, a certain money payback obligation was introduced uh, to parties, there have been some investigation into the case and almost none of the parties uh, 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 complied with that uh, requirement. Uh, it was only in 2020 that when a major uh, change was introduced because the requirement uh, to become eligible for campaign uh, for campaign spending or for uh, funds uh, from the state uh, for campaign spending was increased from 27 candidates from nominating 27 candidates to nominating 71 candidates, which is a huge difference. Uh, but uh, this difference, this uh, uh, restriction, cannot be explained by uh, the problems of campaign financing, but rather is a reflection on the state of the opposition as by increasing the number of candidates required to run in single member districts, uh, the government forced opposition parties to run only one and single uh, party list instead of two. So that was uh, rather um, uh, a reaction to that and not to the campaign financing regulation. Of course, even if it did not uh, directly tackle sham parties, it became more difficult to run as a fake party as well. And we can see after 2014 and 2018, a decrease in fake parties running at 2022 elections. It just happened a few months ago. Although there was a new type of party running, which is a, which seemed to be an entrepreneurial party. And this uh, actually raised our attention, Vidana, is that there was this new type of party, which we would classify entrepreneurial party as a first hunch. As entrepreneurial parties are actually widespread in the Central Eastern European region. So in Slovenia, in Slovakia, in the Czech Republic, we have entrepreneurs who found parties. Some of them are successful, some of them are not very successful, but this is a party type that's uh, known and uh, that is running in the Central Eastern European region. While uh, uh, this new party uh, showed very many uh, characteristics of an entrepreneurial party, the public centered on it as a sham party or as a fake party. So we were really interested to see how come, uh, what, uh, why is that? And uh, uh, Anna uh, carried out a case study into this uh, party, which is called the Solution Movement, that was funded by one of the wealthiest person in the country uh, to try to classify it as a sham party or try to classify it as an entrepreneurial party. So shall I um, stop right here? Hi. Just a quick reminder, we must conclude. Is that okay? Okay, okay, yes, okay. yes. Conclusions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very briefly, Conclusion. thank you. Uh, there we go. Uh, so uh, Anna carried out a case study of the solution movement, and uh, we found that uh, this is a very, uh, actually it has a very typical entrepreneurial party-like characteristics, although it does have some uh, uh, resemblance to sham party. But when we uh, looked into this case deeper, we saw that it's actually the bipolar logic of competition, the two book politics and the institutional pressure on the opposition that uh, presents the need to classify all and every party on the opposition side that does not cooperate as sham party. So while uh, we looked at sham parties, we could see that they hijack state funds Actually, they were neither a distraction nor did they offer diversity in the electoral process. So while if you, if you think of sham parties as a price to pay for democracy, they were pretty harmless in terms of stealing away votes or uh, they were, uh, um, how to say that, that they had no effect on introducing new, new ideas. 
Uh, but that doesn't mean that they did not affect uh, the workings of Hungarian democracy, because by the abundance of sham parties, uh, the trust in electoral institutions decreased highly, and that harmed uh, uh, the electoral integrity very much in the country. And the democratic damage that uh, uh, the campaign financing system and the resulting sham party is closed was um, uh, part of the lack of trust in the public, and also uh, it uh, feeds into electoral backsliding and democratic backsliding. Uh, we are, as I said, in the process of carrying out this research, and we would like to tie back all that we know about sham parties and uh, entrepreneurial parties into how electoral backsliding uh, is happening in our country, what are the perceptions by using the electoral integrity uh, uh, indexes, and how does it feed into the democratic backsliding Hungary is experiencing uh, right now? For that, uh, we are planning to collect more data on sham parties and also include into our comparison different niche parties who are outside of the cooperation of the opposition. And uh, with that, I, I conclude my presentation. Mm -hmm.